As far as conspiracy theories are concerned, Area 51 and Roswell has been the gift that just keeps on giving. Now, tonight's story isn't about little green men or anything remotely like that, but this setting does serve as the backdrop for the story. Another fantastic one from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. Now this one is absolutely fantastic. I'm sure you're going to enjoy listening to it as much as I did recording it. So, I think it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. This has to stop. I'm writing this in the pitch black praying that the letters don't overlap enough to be illegible, pencil snapping every time I try to use the damn thing. Feels like I've spent weeks in here, days at least, but the clock in the corner of the room, the last light blaring in this hellscape, only reads, it's been three hours. Three hours of that dim red glow was more than enough to make me welcome what was soon to come. Three hours trapped with this thing inside my skull specimen 1148 vi in warehouse l the building i was in charge of monitoring one of thousands of microscopic oddities scattered throughout the massive blocks i wasn't even a scientist there in the location they never named in some strange attempt to avoid the garbage fire that was area 51 I was simply a doctor on property, not even one for the far more interesting inhabitants. No, most of the time I just whittled away, kept in the dark on whatever happened there beyond the six foot thick steel walls that separated my office from the warehouse on the other side. Therefore, my interaction with the strange, disturbing and fantastic during my stay was sadly restricted limited to plucking oozing spikes from researchers' skin, cutting fungi, investing a janitor's paws, or deciding if Tylenol was truly a good enough painkiller for a man whose skin had been flipped inside out. That didn't mean I hadn't seen plenty of my ten-year stay here, grabbed right from university before my degree was in hand, with a promise of a two million dollar salary, a fifteen-year commitment, Clothing, housing, food, and whatever else I desire, as long as I leave without a trace. Friendless, estranged, income consisting of McDonald's and forging Piers doctor's notes. Well, I was happy to take the offer. I'm getting off track, sorry. It's hard to concentrate when your brain is slowly being ground to glop inside your skull. Honestly, I only worked a few hours a day as I was only called into my office when someone was hurt, spending the rest of it busying myself with wandering aimlessly through sterile halls, spinning enough in my office chair to break it more than once, and cleaning vials obsessively until they shone. There was no internet down here, seeing how far we were underground, and sadly there wasn't a library I was allowed anywhere near, so aimless wandering was about the most entertainment I was liable to get. That changed a few months ago, however. Previously, I could expect one to four patients a day, maybe six if something particularly infectious or dangerous made its way around. I still shiver when remembering the day that worm got out in Sector X. One was not meant to sew holes through livers. That's as much as I'll say about that. But then, out of nowhere... I was getting ten, then twenty, thirty. I dragged some poor teenager from the kitchen staff to run around handing out Advil and taking names. I needed to just get the slightest hold of what was happening. At first, I thought there was just some large party I wasn't invited to. Everyone got a hangover and came to me as the one source of drugs in the warehouses. It wouldn't be the first time. The last three years of university seemed to just be an endless cycle of that particular emotional hell. But as the day wore on to days, days to weeks, 
until a full month and a half had passed, with patients banging down my door odd hours of the night. It was very clear some overblown New Year's party wasn't to blame. They all had the same symptoms. Intense fatigue, movement issues, and most of all, crippling migraines. The slightest hint of light causing debilitating pain. There wasn't much I could do for them, other than painkillers and time, writing them notes to let them stay in their chambers, with the lights off and floor put on a noise limit, sending them on their way with a smile and some blood to test, forcing myself and the kid to wear safety glasses at all times around patients just to bring some calm, as if we were professionals and not too under-trained, overpaid idiots. The halls soon were silent. The few people milling through had sunken eyes, exhaustion edged in their walk. My patient numbers died out again, from 40 to 20 to 10, eventually back to the usual trickle I expected, as nearly the entirety of Building L's staff was out of commission. The building itself closed down for inspection by people far more qualified than me, which left me with a lot of time on my hands, and even more blood to study. It was strange, though. I... I couldn't find anything. There was nothing there. Just clear, healthy blood, kept in prime conditions. I did everything I could to these vials, diluted them in water, dropped it in a radiated bucket, sent through petri dishes and x-rays and everything else I could think of, which considering I never even probably finished my degree, wasn't much. But every day, the halls grew deader and deader. Soon, residents of Buildings M and K, whose staff had been dispersed into Building L once investigations cleared it, claimed there was nothing out of place beside a broken bottle and the smell of chlorine, but to be safe, put the buildings under quarantine. I'd like them to say that to the men and women currently trapped in beds with an IV drip when the attempts to drink water became too much to bear. Me, of course, living in said housing block, was included in the lockup. Though it seemed like I was the only one mobile enough to be annoyed. Me and the teen from the kitchens. Which made no sense. If it was a virus, we'd be the primary candidates for infection having spent hours tucked away in pitch-black rooms, lit by candle to test the infected blood in the same conditions as the body. Hell, we both slept in there now. Well, that wasn't new for me. My bedroom was attached to the clinic. So, if a midnight emergency came, a knock on the door would be a knock on my door. But that poor kid was trapped on the cots for the precious bit of sleep we did get. We never left that room, the teen and I. For a full week, we ate food I'd stored away in my fridge. The bathroom was connected to my bedroom. Personally, I wasn't sure why he wanted to stay with me. Perhaps he felt bad for leaving me to be worked to death alone, or maybe he was simply too scared of what was out there as well. And honestly, I don't blame him. Time ticked forward. No news, no breakthroughs. Neither of us stepping foot outside the shelter we'd become convinced was our saviour. We may not have known our employers well, but we knew enough to see that if we fell sick, no one was going to come to our rescue. We gathered data through the IV drips, sensors attached. We monitored toxicity and heartbeat and temperature, but not a single goddamn thing was wrong. They were perfectly healthy. Wasting away in a state I've prayed felt like a coma for them, because it certainly didn't for me. A full two months since the infection took hold. The last member of staff was contaminated. A full two months since the infection took hold. Our hiding was over. A full two months since the infection took hold. The thing took the electrician. It was the middle of some time. I didn't know if it was day or night. 
There was no real concept of that down here anymore. We'd covered other clocks in the room long ago, since watching the tick away of it just made everything seem even more bleak. Food supplies were running low. We were relying on the crushed bottoms of cereal bags, scrapings from used avocados and the peels of bananas. Technically, there was nothing stopping us from wandering into the deserted kitchen, cooking up a feast of whatever we'd like and stuffing ourselves full. But neither of us wanted to do that. The outside world had become a danger zone, we convinced ourselves, as if the air in here was filtered. But in the middle of some time, while I cooked up a soup of boiled water and the wilted leaves long expired in the back of the freezer, and the kid went on and on about the girl from Warehouse S he knew was the one, the stove and light and fridge cut out. The hum of air conditioning fell away, and all that was left was a steady wheeze of breathing. We met eyes then. We met eyes with a look of dread. Because if the power was out, so were the IVs. They needed to be set individually up on generators. If the power was out, we were going to need another way to get measurements. If the power was out, we were going to need to go outside. Seeing as I was, you know, equivalent to a school nurse in terms of my job description, we didn't exactly have hazmat suits lying around. We had some surgical masks, sure, which we placed on. Lent the kid a lab coat, more to make him feel better than for actual safety. But other than that, we were armed with nothing but a couple of flashlights, miniature generators, and med packs to be able to assess this situation. We each agreed to take a half of the building. There were no walkie-talkies or any other way to communicate down there, but seeing as the halls were quiet enough to hear a clip nail from across the corridor, we figured, if we needed each other direly, a loud enough yell should suffice. Oh, God. Looking back, <laughs> I fell for all the movie cliches, didn't I? Splitting up in the middle of a spooky building to cover more ground. May as well throw in a, oh, what could go wrong while I'm at it? With nothing but the echo of footsteps for company, I drifted out from the office I'd called sanctuary for months of my life now. The floors were dusty. Not dirty, mind you, but dusty. One or two footprints scattered faintly. Last trickles of the population before they stopped bothering to visit me and instead simply trudged the IV up themselves felt almost disrespectful to unsettle the dust at the time. My half had the kitchen, the large open cafeteria empty of bodies. Trash reeked as if it hadn't been tossed in ages, garbage men being among the first wave. The world was revealed to me only in the circle beam of my flashlight. No life could exist down here, something I hadn't even truly fathomed until now. All this trash just sitting there in the open, and there wasn't a single fly to sample it. We were miles underground, in a sterile facility where everything, everything was recycled and reformed, checked meticulously before you passed through the doors. Nothing came, and nothing left the combination warehouse and housing. It was then I started considering factors other than illness. I considered asbestos in the water supply. Ruled that out when I remembered I'd drunk it. Tried in the air, but I was breathing the same air as everyone else. It was an open vent system. My cleaner was no different than anyone else's, and I sincerely doubted I was the only one who kept to my little corner of the chambers when everything hit. As I finally started to hit the first dormitories, my mind raced faster. Touch. No, I had my hands all over my patients. I had their blood sprinkled into my own cuts from countless accidents. Food? No, when I stocked my kitchen, the infection had already taken hold. Worm. Parasite. Alien creature beamed from the depths of hell. Even then, it would be impossible. It's a living thing, 
They need to, for lack of a better term, relieve themselves. And with our technology, a single stray micro drop of urine would show in the blood. I was procrastinating then. I knew I was. Because I didn't want to open that door. I didn't really want to know what had caused it. I just wanted my good salary and easy job. I'd been able to brag about at the top secret government parties. I was sure I was going to be invited to as a med school dropout. <laughs> I never wanted this. But life doesn't care about what you wanted, I suppose. And so my gloved hand wrapped around the smooth metal handle and pushed. Mr. O'Donnell? My voice was strict. I was never strict with my patients because I never worried for my patients. For the bad cases, my job was to give them the number of the hotline for people actually trained for this shit. And I was worried for my patients here. But I was even more worried for myself. Yes! Came a weak voice from the corner of the room. It was a rather small room though. A bit smaller than a ship cabin. But even then... It was barely audible. I strutted over with all the confidence of a prancing wiener dog, stethoscope on like headphones in a desperate attempt to feel like I wasn't out of my depth. The room smelled sweet, sickeningly sweet, honestly, though I attributed it to Odonna being older than the dirt just outside the walls. It took everything in my precious years of training not to ask how many glade centers he'd shoved into the damn space. Your IV cut. I'm here to repair it. Thank you. He looked all right, honestly, for a man who hadn't been able to move for over a week now. Sure, he was a bit more wasted away, but he wasn't exactly Johnny Bravo to begin with. His pale, papery skin shone blue under my flashlight as I tried to replace the needle. I'm going to be running a few tests on you. I set up the machines, took his heartbeat and temperature. Is that all right? Just make it go away. The desperation in his voice was almost enough to make me hurl. After checking for any new bruising, discoloration, and physical sign of illness at all, and finding nothing, I decided... Fuck it. At this point, let's try for throat redness and pupil dilation. I fumbled with the flashlight, nearly dropping it as I tried to hold it and my stick at the same time, before I finally leaned over to glance into his mouth, holding it open with the stick. Nothing. Literally nothing wrong. All I got for my efforts were fogged up glasses I had to take off. I couldn't bother to care anymore. Honestly, it was clear this man wasn't in a state to judge me. So, with an internal cry of frustration, I shone a light on the pupil, praying for any reaction. Because the universe loves to taunt me so, there was none. Which was the reaction. I didn't believe it at first, that this... This was what we were missing. Shifting the light, I looked closer at the eye. That didn't twitch a bit. At the time, I hadn't noticed it, but heart rate increased. Fingers twitched, muscles tightened, mouth dropped to a perfect O. When I shut off the light to take my notes, there wasn't a sound. Mr. O'Donnell? I admit I'm probably a bit old to be calling other men mister, but it's a habit I doubt I'll outgrow, if for no other reason I haven't the time to. Nothing. Just mouth dropped to a perfect O. I leaned in again, shining the black light a little more this time, so I could view the whole face, which now seemed paralyzed in place, stone-like, every muscle frozen. I should have been a good doctor then. I should have done something other than stare into the eyes of a man who put his life in my hands. But I'm not a doctor. I'm a coward. 
I'm a coward too afraid to tell my parents I miss them, let alone comfort and treat a man turning to stone in front of my eyes. Instead, I pack my bag. Calmly, coolly, Ivy plugged in, closer to the man, little red light blinking on and off and on and off at his heartbeat. Unlock the door behind me. I didn't do pupil exams after that, for a long, long while. I knew I should. I knew it was the right thing to do. I knew it was the closest thing to a breakthrough we had. But seeing their faces go cold, heartbeat go rapid, I couldn't. Occasionally, my hand would slip and the light would land on someone's eyes. Sometimes the person would go rigid, like O'Donna. Others, they'd scream and writhe in pain, lashing out and crying. One grabbed the scalpel from my makeshift desk of her nightstand and tried to cut the bulb. Instead, succeeded in severing my fingernail. Looking back, I don't know why I didn't just quit. What I was doing wasn't doing much good. I know, if I were to live like that, trapped in a hospital bed, I prefer to have my veins untapped and fade away instead of having to do what I know needs to be done when this story is told. After a few hours, drifting room to room, in the pitch black and deathly silence, with nothing but my flickering flashlight to follow me, there was a single room left. A young woman, Ms. Weyfeld, one of the lead environmentalists in Warehouse L, in charge of everything from temperature to humidity. I remembered her, vaguely, from my repeated attempts to convince her there was no reason to keep the hall's arctic cold. She told me, as a medical officer, I should know it was to prevent viruses from spreading. I, in reply, said I'd rather sweat E. coli than suffer the freezing any longer. The air was lowered ten degrees that evening. I had it in for her for a little while after that, perhaps not being as gentle as I should have, bandaging a cut she'd gotten from a broken wine glass, but we were civil. It was almost a joke by then, but even if I'd despised her with all my being, I wouldn't have wished this fate upon her. As one of the higher-ups, she had what none of the lowly workers like me had, sunlight. Well, not actual sunlight, we were obviously too far underground for that, but the roof of her quarters had a screen atop, projecting the image of a sunny blue sky. It had been the only benefit of being sent for discipline, getting the slightest taste of the world outside. Now, without it, from the power outage, the room was dingy and as cold as the rest of them. I let myself in, went through the motions of plugging the machines into the battery generators, doing a sweep of the room for anything off, and uncovered Weyfeld's face from under the heavy blankets. She, as one of the more recently ill, actually began to stir. Doctor. Her voice was slurred, almost drunk, eyes shut tight, timed with the beep of the IV machine. Cover the light. Ah, oh, right, light sensitivity. Maybe even worse than I thought. I did as she asked, using a stray sock to lay over the control panel, blurring out the little red numbers on the screen. She coughed into her hand, eyes opening just a little before closing. Any progress? Yes, I lied, because I'm a coward. We should have a cure up within the hour. You're a shit liar, you know. Had to try. Pure, black silence. I went to go away. I wanted to go away. I wanted to retreat to the halls and never come back. But Weyfeld, determined to somehow make my life hell, actually dragged herself up to sit. I think it's my eyes, she muttered. There's something throbbing right behind them, in my temple. Check them for me, won't you, Doc? 
She spoke like some old cartoon character, and, even in the pitch black, I could just feel her smile covering up the desperation in her eyes. I couldn't leave then. It wasn't an option anymore. My feet dragged along the tile, shuffled and slow, hand shaking. I'd have to shine a light in them. If you'll get rid of this, I'm fine with that. Why did that have to be the answer? Lean back, I instructed, using my little white light to raise her head back. She did as asked, eyes open, skin clammy and pale white, for her dark skin. Stealing my nerves, I raised the light to her pupil. And she screamed. She screamed. She screamed so loud my hand slipped. The flashlight dropped onto her nose, still shining in her eyes as I flailed. She was paralyzed, unable to do anything but scream louder and louder. My feet scrambling back before they hit the wall. I wanted to run, but without the light I couldn't find the door. I tried anyway, feeling along the wall for the metal handle, before quiet again. The screaming stopped. All was still. Way? My voice was cautious, taking a careful step towards the light. No response. With shaking breaths, I leaned over her, looked into her eyes, red and veined as a junkie's, when I noticed they were bulging, just slightly, enough that if she were walking around, I wouldn't have suspected a thing, assume she forgot to wash off some eyeliner from the night before. Black ringed her eyes like a child's drawing, where they outline everything in an attempt to make it all pop. I raised the light again, over Wayfeld's still body. She wasn't dead. I knew that by the ivy's still constant clicking. But she was scared. Her heart beat faster and faster as I moved her hand for a better look, brushing back some of her hair. And I noticed it came back wet. I assumed it was sweat. That was to be expected, what with the air conditioner she so loved to torch me with down. The temperature was slowly rising in the crock pot we were living in. Air filtration was down as well, something that hadn't bothered me until it passed my mind, but now that it had, it was all I could focus on. I raised myself up, turning the light on and off and on and off to get any sort of reaction, but nothing would happen. My hands were almost soaked from trying to move her to a better position, before my hand came across a chunk. Sweat didn't have chunks. It felt like mucus. I hate to be crass, but it felt like those clumps of white mucus you get when you blow your nose too hard during a cold. It was warm and fleshy to the touch, spreading like jello when my finger pressed it down. I really, deeply, truly wish I had just walked out of that room. With reluctance, I slowly raised my hand, bringing my light to match it. It was covered in red down to the wrist. I nearly threw up right there. My sleeve was soaked. Sticky warm liquid drenched my cuticles and covered my nails like some sort of sickly polish. It was thicker than blood should be, but just as red. So goddamn red. And, under my nail, there was something pink. I moved the light to the woman's neck, working it up until I saw her ear. And then, I did vomit. A large string of pink was splayed on her pillow the squishy tissue I'd felt before. My mind drew blank to what it could be. It looked almost like pasta, strangely enough, long and thin and connected, except for where my meddling had broken the chain. 
my hand, still shaking, flash bits of light in her eyes by accident. Every time it did, the chain would grow. And grow it did. When I saw that, I froze the light in place, watching with sick fascination as, truly like a pasta press, as I shone the light in her eyes more and more, the sticky, fatty pink pushed out of her ears and then began to dribble out of her mouth and tear ducts. I couldn't make myself stop. I couldn't make myself move. I was too shocked to... to well, that doesn't matter much now, does it? It doesn't matter because I could have shut the light off if I wanted, and nothing would have changed as the sky above stuttered to life, illuminating the entire room in its warm blue glow. She was dead. Her heart was beating, but she was dead, I knew, by the time the pink stopped oozing from her orifices. There was nothing left of her inside. My own vision was hazy now, blurred over in what I assumed to be tears, as I forged my way out of the door, crumbling to my knees right outside it. All I could do was hear for what felt like miles in every direction. It was the sound of screaming, endless screaming as the overhead lamps roared ahead. Some tried to flee, I think, but none even made it to their doors, since all of the wet, meaty flops I heard were behind closed doors. I needed to get out of here, I needed to grab that kid and get out of here. I didn't know how. I didn't care if I was going to have to raid the mess hall for spoons and dig my way out one grain at a time, but we needed to leave. My feet charged. Each step I got, drowning out the hysterical cries and for some laughter. This system we had, assuming we could hear each other in the silence, was garbage now. Now I was going to have to rely on the old-fashioned method of running like mad. The light blurred my vision. I spent so long accustomed to wandering with the single beam of my flashlight that having the overhead whir with electricity made my temples throb. But my feet kept moving. They were going to keep moving no matter what. At least, that was the superhero vision I had of myself. After what felt like hours, days, years of my life, my exhaustion forced me to rest, hand grasping the wall to lean on and to pant. The screeching wails were still going strong, tangled with whimpers and wails. I could only pray the kid wasn't one of them. Dragging myself forward, almost more with my hands than legs, I made it to the end of the final corridor, and there... I saw him, among the electrical equipment. I hadn't thought anything odd at first. He was young, I mean, I was young too, but to him I'd be a dinosaur, and young kids like that always took so quick to electronics that it was scary. I'd seen him futz around with the lab equipment as if it were a smartphone. It hadn't taken long to put two and two together and ascertain he was the one to fix the lights. Jeremy, I whispered. I don't know why. There were a lot of actions I didn't understand, and don't even to this moment. We need to run. I didn't get a response. My breath halted in my throat. No, this... this wasn't right. Jeremy, he was a loud kid, Lanky with curly red hair and a constant need to prove to the room he was there and he mattered. But right now, he was just standing, still as a ghost, staring straight ahead at the wall, his back to me. I was more cautious now, reaching my hand to grasp to his shoulder, wrenching it back with wavering resolve to look into his face. It wasn't his face anymore. His mouth was gurgling with blood, thicker than it had any right to be, pink strewn down his shoulders and ears, dangling rope from the canal. His eyes had popped all the way out of their sockets, connected to them at nose level only by a struggling red vein. Inside the socket, 
I saw squirming. I saw a pulsing green moss, slimy and wet. I saw it grow in real time, pushing the last of what I could only assume to be brain matter out of Jeremy's ears, and then grow still. I dropped the body, hearing it crack against the ground, giving the creature inside the help it needed to give the final push of snapping the skull in half, bits of fibrous ooze showing through where his brain once sat. I didn't know what to do. I still don't know what would have been right. I was trapped, now, alone with this... This... Knowing what this was. This wasn't a virus. This wasn't a gas leak or migraine. This wasn't a worm or anything else I could describe with human tongue. But it was alive. It was a live, conscious creature. Some sort of moss plant bug thing without eyes or mouth or guts, some sort of monstrosity that took root in its host and blossomed from the light. And then my head began to ache. My feet moved faster than my mind as I felt my nose begin to trickle blood, flying down the steps and stairways to my office, crashing the door behind me and shutting every light in the room I could, curling up in the corner shaking mad. My glasses were still in my shirt. Optic nerve, I realized. This thing spread its pollen through the air or eye contact. <laughs> I don't know, but it traveled through the tear duct and into the eye, where it lies in wait and grows and grows until it crowds out everything but the very primal base, leaving its host nothing but a beating heart and hollow cavity didn't take much to figure out that thing was inside of me now. And that brought me here, I'm afraid. I don't know what to do. I should shut off the little red light that tells me the time. I'm sure it's letting this thing grow, but I needed to write this. I needed to leave some sort of record of what happened in Warehouse L. I don't know how or why it happened. I don't know if it was the drop bottle they found, or some underground creature no one had thought to keep out. Don't even know if this thing's from Earth. <laughs> Now's not the time for conspiracy theories, though, I suppose. Don't know what it's time for at all, actually. I'm going to turn off the little light left. What happens next? I don't know. I could attempt to live my life in pitch black down here. I could scoop out my eyes with a spoon and spend the rest of my life navigating the narrow halls through touch until I find the mess hall, gorging on rotting bananas for the rest of my life. I could use the scalpel to cut my throat, end it all here. Maybe there's a reason this thing keeps your heart awake. It needs it. So, if I could starve at least one of them of a meal, it'd be a minor victory. My mind turned to Jeremy, skull cracked and eyes hanging, knots on a long, glinting rope. <laughs> Scalpel it is then. So that one was weird and wonderful, wasn't it? I really enjoyed that one. Any thoughts you have? Comments? Please, in the comment section below the video. And as ever, I'll do my best to join in the chat. A uh, very busy time of year for me at the moment, coming to the end of the academic year. So, I'm really busy, but, well, I'll do my best to join in the chat as much as I can. Well, that's me for another night. But I, of course, as ever, will be back with you again very, very soon. And I hope you're going to join me. Until then... Sweet dreams and bye-bye.
thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>